Okay, good morning. It's nine o'clock on Tuesday morning in London. Um, welcome to the launch of Build Back Fairer, the COVID-19 Marmot Review. My name is Richard Horton. I work at The Lancet and it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. One lesson of COVID-19 is that we are not dealing with a straightforward epidemic of a new coronavirus. Um, far from it, we're actually facing a synthesis of epidemics, a virus certainly, but a virus that produces worse outcomes in those with a history of non-communicable diseases, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, and a synthesis of epidemics that is far worse for those living in settings of material deprivation. Now this reframing of the pandemic as a syndemic, a synthesis of epidemics, is not simply playing with words or pedantry. Unless we understand the interaction of the biological with the social determinants of COVID-19, we will neither be able to recover <clears throat> from the suffering that everybody has been through this year, we will not be able to prepare for future outbreaks properly if we don't understand this interaction between the biological and the social. So this report led by Professor Sir Michael Marmot and supported by the Health Foundation is not only important, it's also urgent and demands immediate political attention. So let me welcome and thank Michael for his work and invite him to present the report's findings. We're then going to have a panel discussion um, with Andy Burnham and Angela Donkin. Kevin Fenton can't join us unfortunately this morning um, and we will then have an audience question and answer. So Michael the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And your point about the synthesis of epidemics is well taken. That indeed is the thrust of our report. Build Back Fairer, the COVID-19 Marmot Review, the pandemic, socioeconomic and health inequalities in England. When you look at the distribution of COVID-19 mortality, it looks very similar to the distribution of mortality from all causes. The, these are areas in which people live, classified according to deprivation, the most deprived, all causes of death, and you see what's now become a very familiar social gradient in mortality. And then you see the social gradient in COVID-19. It looks almost parallel to the social gradient in all cause or in non-COVID-19 deaths. It means exactly as Richard said in his introduction, the causes of inequalities in health more general overlap considerably with the causes of inequalities in COVID-19. That was males, this is females. And again, you see this very familiar social gradient. It means that the inequalities in society that are leading to inequalities in health are leading to inequalities in COVID-19. And then in addition to the social and economic excess, we have black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. These are ONS data. You look women, high mortality in black British. Much of that excess can be explained by geography where people live and more by other socioeconomic characteristics. Interestingly, in the case of Black British and uh, Black Caribbean, Black African and Black Caribbean, not much of the excess can be explained by prior health conditions. Most of it is linked to deprivation, that women and men on the other side, mostly linked to deprivation. With Bangladeshi, more of it can be explained by prior health conditions, but again, most can be explained by geography and socioeconomic characteristics. And when we look at excess mortality, 
which looks at the prediction from the previous five years of how many deaths would have occurred this year and how many did occur, the excess mortality was highest in England than in any other European country, higher than in Spain, Scotland, Sweden, higher than in all of these countries, at least until the current spike in the US, it was higher in England than in the United States. And looking at the US, all of us are agreed that the US has been absolute disaster in controlling the pandemic and the excess mortality was bigger in England. When you think of where we were pre-pandemic, our February report, we drew attention to the fact that the increase in life expectancy had slowed down. In fact, the slowdown in life expectancy was nearly the slowest of all rich countries. Only Iceland and the US were slower. Inequalities between regions and socioeconomic groups were increasing and life expectancy for the poorest people was falling. And now during the pandemic, we have the highest excess mortality. Is there a link between our poor health situation coming into the pandemic and what happened during? And I think there is. And I suggest four ways that could work. Poor governance and political culture during the decade from 2010 on and during the pandemic. Increasing social and economic inequalities and increases in child poverty particularly reduction in spending on public services that was done in a most regressive way. The poorer the area, the steeper the cuts. We were ill prepared. And England was, as Richard said, coming into the pandemic in an unhealthy state. And then we look at some of the, the effects socially of the pandemic. Increases in the educational divide. Teachers were surveyed of how their pupils were doing. In least deprived schools, this is the proportion that said their pupils were not behind, one month behind, two months behind. In the most deprived areas, pupils six months or more behind, five months, four months behind, you can see an increase in the educational divide, which will have long-term implications for inequalities in health. Food poverty food insecurity, pre-COVID-19, and then March to August, these data from the Food Foundation, particularly for three or more children, two children, big rise in food insecurity. It took a young footballer to get changes in government policy. Psychological distress before and during COVID-19, particularly big increase for young people but an increase in psychological distress at every age. For men and women, an increase, and for all ethnic groups, an increase. And interestingly, for people at every level of education, an increase in psychological distress. Unemployment was not so big to begin with because of the furlough scheme and protection, but it's set to grow and it's particularly young people who are affected. This is 16 to 24 year olds, the rise in unemployment. There will be rises in other age groups too, but it's particularly young people. And of course, low income workers are most likely to be in sectors that were shut down by decile of earnings. The lower the decile of earnings, these data come from the IFS, the lower the decile of earnings, the greater the likelihood of being in a shutdown sector. And the percent of people who reported their finances did, had been negatively affected. Single adults, couples with non-dependent, couples with dependent children, adverse impact on their finances. And ranking of local authorities where employment recovery from COVID-19 is likely to be hardest. And is likely to be hardest because of prior deprivation and because of high employment in sectors that are particularly vulnerable. So the Southeast will do much better 
the further north will do much less well. What do we recommend? Well, we've made a whole slew of specific recommendations. And I invite you to look at our executive summary for those. But essentially, we're saying we must not go back to the status quo. Where we were in February was far from desirable. I've talked about the slowdown improvement in life expectancy, the increase in inequalities, and the fact that life expectancy for the poorest people outside London was going down. So we do not want to go back to the status quo. I would say we have to deal with those four elements that I suggest linked our poor health pre-pandemic to our poor health during the pandemic, which is governance and political culture, the increase in social and economic inequalities, the reduction in spending on public services, all of these have to be reversed. And the fact that England was unhealthy coming into the pandemic, it means we should put a fair distribution of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy. I've been fond of quoting what New Zealand did, the New Zealand Treasury in 2019. They put well-being at the heart of the Treasury's strategy. We want to build an economy that works for everybody with a fair distribution of health and well-being at its heart. Thank you, Richard. That's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, um, Michael. That was a beautiful and succinct summary of a very powerful report. Uh, I see that we've already had a question asking whether the slides will be shared uh, and hopefully they will be posted on the Health Foundation's website at, um, at some point. Uh, and they're all, they're all in our report as well. So. They're all in your report. Excellent. Excellent. Now, let me turn to our, um, our panel. We're very fortunate to have Andy Burnham with us, the mayor of Greater Manchester, who's been such a powerful um, voice this year um, in all years, but especially this year. Um, and uh, thanks, Andy, for joining us. And Angela Donkin, who's the chief social scientist at the National Foundation for Educational Research. Angela, welcome this morning. Um, perhaps I'd like to just begin by giving both of you the floor to offer your reflections on Michael's report. I know both of you are very familiar with Michael's work over the years, um, but in the context, particularly of this year, of course. Andy, why don't we begin with you and then we'll go to Angela. Well, thank you very much indeed, Richard. Good morning, everybody. And I think on behalf of everybody on this call, I, I, I'll begin with a, a thank you to Michael um, for the incredible clarity and precision that he brings uh, to this uh, analysis. And, and really it's, it's undeniable um, what, what has led to the poorest parts of our country being hit hardest uh, during this pandemic. Michael has explained clearly why that has happened. In fact, he gave us a premonition of what was about to happen to the country back in February when we came together to launch the, um, the, the, the 10 years on uh, review. And the truth of the matter is all of the weaknesses that Michael identified and his, and his team identified in that 10 years on report, all of those weaknesses have been ruthlessly attacked uh, by COVID-19. And uh, that explains why, um, as I say, some of our poorest communities have been have suffered greatly uh, during this year. So I'll just pick up on three points that uh, are in the report, uh, Richard. Mm. First, in the lessons learned section, Michael talks about the trade-off between health and the economy. And I think this is an issue that has kind of been got wrong all year. Um, if we go back uh, to the original um, lockdown, if, if we remember, stay at home didn't apply for large sec sections of the, the country, actually. Uh, the poorer the community, the more most people were not staying at home. They were actually still out at work, working in essential retail, construction, warehousing, distribution. And I just want to share with, uh, with everybody this morning what that was like for me, because I, I was inundated with complaints, absolutely inundated uh, about the lack of safe distancing, um, hygiene, uh, it, face coverings, PPE in, in the workplace. Uh, and that went on for, for, a, for a good month. So, 
know, the idea that the whole country was staying at home, I'm afraid it isn't the case. The poorer the community, the more likely it was the vast majority of people there were working. People's experience of the pandemic has been extremely different according to where they live and what job uh, people, people do. And then, so basically they were allowed to work. It would have been better to put health first, I think as the team is saying, and deal decisively with the cases, bring them right down. But instead we had a halfway house approach to the uh, national lockdown. And then that was compounded by, in my view, uh, we were too late in because of the confliction around um, uh, health and the economy. And then we were too early out for the north of England. And I think that was driven by economic interests uh, in London. It was lifted too early for the north and we've struggled ever, ever since because our cases were, were high. And again, that was uh, not getting this trade off right between health and the, and the economy. Um, and I think we're still in a position now where we have new tier two and tier three restrictions, which again, nowhere near get the balance right. They are, to, uh, to be kindest, they are unsatisfactory halfway house arrangements that give a complete green light to non-essential retail at this time of year. I mean, how on earth is that going to uh, get the required uh, change in, in, in cases? I, I don't believe it is. But finally on this point, Richard, I just would want to add, it's also, they've not got the trade off right between health and public spending. So it's wider than just the economy. All the way through, we were warning the government that the failure to support people on low wages to self-isolate was a major cause of spread in some of our poorest communities. And months and months went by before any meaningful recognition was made of this, of this point. We launched a campaign called Time Out to help out with the TUC um, to say, look, support people to be off work. We had a survey from Unison early in the crisis that said 80% of care assistants in the Northwest feared they wouldn't be able to self-isolate if they were asked to or if they needed to. That social care where the staff didn't have enough wage security to put their health first. I mean, this issue was never dealt with uh, properly and still hasn't been dealt with properly because they've constantly been trading off the health measures versus public spending. And that was very much at the heart of the row I had with the government over the original uh, tier three. You will not get people's support uh, for a lockdown if you are not helping people to deal with the economic consequences of that lockdown. Health should have been put first, but all of the public spending should have been put in place to ensure compliance with that, with that lockdown. And they refused uh, to do that. And I think that's been, uh, I'm afraid, some of the story that, that we've had uh, all year. If I, if I move on to a second issue, housing, I think everything Michael says about housing is, is mapped out completely clearly uh, through what's happened during this pandemic. If you go back to the middle of the summer when Greater Manchester first went under local restrictions, effectively tier two restrictions, it wasn't just us, it was parts of East Lancashire and parts of West Yorkshire. And if you draw a map of that footprint, that precise footprint, what you will find is it maps almost entirely the footprint of the housing pathfinder projects of the Labour government that I was in of the early 2000s. Um, a previous failed attempt to level up because the government tried to redesign people's communities from Whitehall and unsurprisingly people weren't having it. Uh, but nevertheless that poor quality housing uh, remains in place in those communities and you simply cannot safely self-isolate if you are living in a, in, in a poor quality private rented overcrowded home uh, in the same way that you can if you are living in a much a much bigger a much bigger property and that was the story we were getting earlier this year those same people I was just saying before Richard who were out at work because they had to be out at work because the economy was left open and they wouldn't get any wages if they were not at work, construction workers and others. They were then sending me emails saying, and I'm going home to a home where I've got my elderly mother and I'm really worried, what do we do? And that's a story of this pandemic that I don't think has been, has been fully told, but that was the experience for large numbers of people and the poor quality of housing in many of our communities. This year has damaged people's health, but always damages people's health and the poor standards, the lack of regulation in the private rented sector is a major, major driver of that. Richard, I'll finish on the point about governance, um, finally, because again, 
uh, Michael is so right to raise this. I just want you to imagine a different way in which this year might have played out. If we think of all of those billions that were identified for test, trace and isolate, imagine a situation back in February when the local testing teams weren't disbanded. In fact, a decision was taken to build them up and beyond that, build up the contact tracing teams that local councils have within their public health departments. And beyond that, also then building the, the test and trace function. In effect, to localize the whole operation and make it a door-to-door, uh, -door, face to face uh, community team operation uh, where people were given a you know, whole package of test traits and isolate in one, in one go. And it was all overseen by, by local councils. And the billions of pounds that have flooded into the, um, to the national system, in fact, would have gone into the, into the infrastructure of local governments across the country. Um, and the benefits that that would have brought for kind of keeping wealth within our, within our uh, communities. I, I think if we have done that, we would have had a functioning test and trace uh, system uh, by now. But this is the, the white hall way, isn't it? Um, instead of uh, localizing, it centralizes and privatizes, and that's what's happened uh, this year. And in the end, we have wasted billions of pounds on a system that doesn't work, and we are now managing this virus through the winter by restrictions. I mean, that is where we've, we've ended up. And if central government could learn to trust local government, fund local government, and not take on all of the responsibilities itself, which, in, which leads to a dysfunctional way of working because the center is trying to do too much, we would have had a much better response uh, to, this, to this pandemic. So Richard, I, I, will, I will leave it there. I just hope every single person in Whitehall and Westminster reads this, uh, reads this uh, report, uh, Build Back Fairer, because if this country does not learn, does not listen to what Michael and his team are saying, and does not make substantial changes to go into another health crisis without having addressed these issues, uh, would be, well, it would be worse than a national scandal. It would be unforgivable. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Andy, for those points. And uh, we've got some great questions coming through at the moment, um, some of them very much directed uh, at, at you, and I'll come back to you for to follow up on some of those. But let me turn to Angela straight away. Angela, the floor is yours. Very keen to hear your reflections on Michael's report. Okay, well, good morning to everybody. Um, really good to be here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's unsurprising given the inequalities that um, were evident before the, the pandemic that um, we see what we do now. Um, so the, the mortality rates for those who are disadvantaged have been higher, but I want to say something about children here. So children who are in disadvantaged areas or disadvantaged families have been disproportionately impacted and Michael's shown some of that in his report. Um, from, from the work that we've done and, and what Michael's shown, we, I can say that they were less engaged in remote learning. They were more likely to have fallen behind and fallen behind by much more than other children in terms of their schooling. They're more likely to be um, at home, maybe because they've been sent home because the cases are higher in their area or because actually their family is more likely to be living with somebody who is at high risk. So those are the facts. And if we don't do something to redress that imbalance, then we're just storing up further problems and further inequality for the future. So some of the suggestions that are in the report I fully um, support. Um, I want to talk about one, which is about funding. So let's just call this one out. You do, in my mind, leveling up means reducing the difference between disadvantaged and less disadvantaged. It does not mean giving more money to more advantaged schools. That is what the school funding formula does this year. The, the increases in school funding do this year, sorry. They're giving proportionately more to more advantaged schools. Okay, so we need, we need a proper levelling up, in my mind. Um, on funding, we've recently um, shown that about a quarter of schools are at risk of not having enough money. 
So the cost of doing all of that COVID uh, cleaning, social distancing, there's a cost to that. Some schools were nearly in deficit at the beginning or in deficit, and they're going to struggle. And what concerns me is that there, there has been a billion pounds uh, made for uh, available for catch up, but schools might start re-diverting that money just to keep their, their schools safe and not providing the tutoring and the other intensive catch up that is needed. So the, there are programs for catch up, tutoring is good. Um, it's not going to be widely available enough. Um, and I think uh, catch up needs to be for longer than just this year, because as we've seen, you know, children are going to be falling behind this year as well. On last thing on funding, Michael, you say, and, and I've said this before with others, we need to look at the early years workforce. We need to think about the pay in that sector. We need to professionalize the sector. Other countries that have graduate led early years workforce I, I completely support um, looking at the pay of that sector. But I think what we probably need to think about then is whether or not we have a state run uh, early childcare setting sector because parents can't necessarily pay those high wages. So I think that we need to rethink how we fund um, early years because it, it is incredibly important to reduce those inequalities as, as early as we can. I'm gonna leave it there. I could go on and on. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great, Angela. Thank you very much indeed. Um, now, let, let me begin with a couple of questions. Um, and I, I don't want this to be an echo chamber, so I, I want to be uh, a little bit of the devil's advocate on, on this. So Michael, I'm going to come to you first um, and then to Andy and Angela. Um, the fact is this country is now in the worst economic recession for 300 years. So a simple question, can the country afford what you're proposing? And you need to put your, you're muted, Michael. I think I was, the government muted me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a gremlin somewhere. Um, can the country afford it? Absolutely. My understand, my primitive understanding of economics, I think is a good deal better than many of the members of the cabinet. Um, <laughs> We have zero interest rates, in some cases negative interest rates, you have to pay the government, uh, or you have to pay to have your money stored. We are um, now among the lowest taxed countries in Europe, and we control our own currency. Take those three conditions, you can borrow, more or less with impunity, you can tax uh, and have a more progressive tax system, and you can print money, quantitative easing, you can do it. And we've tried the austerity experiment. We did that in 2010, and health stopped improving, inequalities got worse, and health for the poorest people went down. That experiment didn't work. So we know that doesn't work. And I ask you, can we afford not to do it? I put in the report, we rank on child well-being we rank 27th out of 36 countries. Can we afford not to spend on that? Um, Marcus Rashford drew the attention and the shame of the country to the fact that poor children were going to bed hungry. Can we afford not to spend on that? We can't afford not to do it. And the econ economic conditions make it possible. Thanks, Michael. Um, Andy, Angela, on cost? from your respective perspectives? I agree with everything that Michael's just said, uh, Richard, but let me, give you, um, let, me, let me give you a specific example. So we are obviously now turning our minds to the recovery and we're going to have to get serious about job creation, mm. quality job creation, um, because, you know, this is going to be a, well, it could be like the 1980s or even worse in, in the north of England, unless significant uh, resource goes into uh, into quality jobs but that could be about building back fairer mm. so if i give you a very specific example we are going to need to retrofit every single property in the uk if we're to hit 2050 uh, for a, a zero zero carbon economy and society and we have a plan in greater manchester for a 2038 um uh, zero carbon greater manchester 
it is obvious to me, absolutely obvious, that we now stand up a major retrofitting program, pretty much in all parts of the country, but, but greatest in the areas that are ready to go because we have a, a plan to do it. These require new skills, um, but uniquely, I think in the North of England, in my lifetime, the message to young people applying for those courses to do those skills and therefore those jobs on those retrofitting programs, it's a message that says this is a pretty much a job for life because the country is gonna have to do this over the next 50 years. Mm. And if you're trained here in Greater Manchester to work here first, you will be able to take your skills elsewhere as the, the country uh, catches up. And actually in retrofitting those homes, you will actually make them cheaper uh, for people to run. You will make them safer, uh, healthier. And that I think is a, you know, rather than sort of talking around the issue, I'm giving you Richard, trying to a mm. specific example. Yeah of how we can build back fairer. And Britain needs to get its mindset into this uh, moment of the COP in Glasgow next year. We have to put a, ourselves in a, a light where we are responding seriously to the pandemic, but we also have forward facing plans that show we are serious about climate justice as well and recognizing all the damage that that does to our poorest uh, communities. So this is a moment to build back greener, definitely greener and fairer, uh, reduce people's household bills, give them safer homes, give quality jobs uh, to our young people. That gives some meaning to a phrase called levelling up, which currently lacks any substance whatsoever. Well, let me take that um, comment, Andy, and, and go to Angela. Um, you talked about levelling up, Angela. Um, how do we level up um, in this economic catastrophe that we're currently living through? Yeah, so I mean, I think that um, clearly, you know, there are going to be a number of pressures on government, um, but it's not just government alone that can do this. Um, so let's think about wages. And I mean, you know, I may maybe sound like I should be in a far gone era, but um, talking about redistribution of income and wealth um, is highly unpopular. Um, and makes people very, very uncomfortable. But there are a number of companies where, um, you know, the CEO gets, you know, hundreds of times more than people who are working at the bottom. There have been reports looking at this, you know, really people think that at about 10 or 14 times, um, that the, if the CEO gets 10 or 14 times um, the amount of the person at the bottom, that's about okay. Um, so if, if that actually happened, um, then actually you'd have quite a lot of money uh, beginning to circulate to those people who, you know, you think about the top of a company, how many Learjets can any one person buy? You know, but where actually if you start redistributing that money at the bottom, then people have the, the opportunity to buy uh, a new washing machine because theirs is broken or go out and buy the, the right amount of food because their children are hungry. So I think that there is something there and I, you know, it's unpopular, but I will bring it I, up. I'm up for redistribution as well. So, so am I, Angela. Sorry, Richard, I'm going to ask Angela a quick question. I'm up for it as well. But are you convinced now is the time for a universal basic income, Angela? Um, I think, I mean, I think it's an interesting idea. I like the idea of it mainly because it takes away from some of the stigma of being um, unemployed. Sometimes that is just what happens to you. So if everybody has got a basic income and then you build up from that, I think that that fits into kind of more of a well-being agenda. So I like, I like it from that perspective. I think it gives people um, a sense that we're all in it together and we're all the same um, and I suppose the only the, from a kind of economic perspective would be thinking then about uh, getting the incentives right and sufficient to uh, encourage people into, into work um, because I am aware of what what the uh, um, criticisms are with regards to oh will you know is that dead weight are we giving people money that they wouldn't necessarily need so I think it does need to be balanced properly but I think if mm. done well it will give people kind of a better sense of feeling part of a, a, a society that actually 
gives a shit, mm. basically. Andy, can I ask you a question? It's come through on the um, on on the Q and A. Um, you talked about the centralising power. Uh, in the country and the unwillingness to trust local government. So what practical steps right now can local government um, do to, t to tackle health inequalities? You're not completely disabled, are you, from, from, from action? What can, what can you do? How are you thinking? You talked about thinking through the recovery. What's going through your mind about what you might be able to do? Well, there are things we can do, Richard, and councils are doing it, to, to be honest. So everything Angela said before about the early years, we have a huge focus on, on the early years in Greater Manchester, informed by Michael and his analysis. And I, think I always go back to it, the first conversation he and I had when he gave me his report as health secretary 10 years ago, February 2010, was if you do nothing else, focus on the early years, I don't know, paraphrasing, but it was something like, something like that. And councils do do that, to be honest. Um, we've had a big, big focus in Greater Manchester on school readiness. And I could won't take you through everything today, but there are some genuinely innovative things that we have started to do. We've digitalized the ages and stages questionnaire held by health visitors so that mm -hmm. all public service professionals can spot the kids who are not developing and therefore not likely to be school ready. And that's just a simple thing, mm. but could bring quite a dividend. Mm. So what I would say is, and this is where I agree entirely with Angela's analysis, councils want to do it. Indeed, they are doing it. They are just so badly underfunded. Uh, and again, looking at cuts budgets next year that they can't in any way bring forward the scale of intervention that they would that, that they would want to do. You know, the closer you work to communities, this is my learning coming out of Westminster, Richard. Yeah. The closer you get, I've observed that the more in touch people are, the more kind of, they know what needs to be done. They know their communities, they know what needs to be done. And, and they are living in a world where the goldfish mentality of Westminster is constantly distracting them with other things and cutting their funding and God knows. And, and that is just, I'm afraid, the, re the reality of, 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 of politics in this country. One minister comes in and this is a thing, and then they go, and then it's another priority. If, you, if we funded local and regional government properly and trusted them, I think they would do the things that would make the most difference in their communities. We've just had an immature approach to this in this country for a very long time. Thanks, Andy. Michael, let me ask you a question. It's actually a question that's come from um, somebody called Chris Ham, and I'm sure it's the Chris Ham. Um, uh, and Chris is asking, are the policy implications of this report any different from those of previous reports that you've done? In other words, has COVID-19 um, given you any new perspectives that you hadn't previously reflected upon? What's different about COVID-19 compared with pre-COVID-19? I said at the beginning, as Andy said when we met in February um, to release our 10 years on report, that the pandemic will reveal the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. So in that sense, it's not new so much as an intensification of what we knew before, particularly with respect to the disadvantage of black, Asian and minority ethnic groups that's very much come to the fore, but an intensification. But we then take it as an opportunity and that's why we call it build back fairer. Mm. And relation, in relation to the question that Andy asked Angela about universal basic income, I think it ought to be, we, we, as we think about building back fairer, we need to think at two levels. What are the specific steps we can take right now and he gave the example of early years. We want today's preschool kids to have the best possible readiness for school. And there's some really practical steps you can take that are very concrete. Right now, it needs funding, but would improve children's readiness for school and reduce inequality. So there are some really concrete practical steps right now. But we ought to be rethinking what kind of society do we want that's greener, What's the nature of work? We've forgotten the whole 
fear about automation, that there won't be any jobs. There'll be a few highly skilled jobs and then the mass of people will be unemployed. Well, you know, we've forgotten that fear. What kind, of, how do we distribute wealth? How do we distribute work? Uh, what's the balance of work and family life? Um, one idea is a universal basic income. Another is universal basic services. Uh, we need to have that discussion. Of, uh, should we be having a four day working week? How do we balance work and family? Uh, rather than say, oh my God, we've got to get back to GDP growth and we've got to actually reestablish the status quo so society looks exactly like it did before, would be a colossal mistake. Let's rethink. Let's actually think about the place of work. And as Andy pointed out, you know, we should have been thinking about affordable housing for a very long time, affordable, high quality housing. So the pandemic has brought all of these things to the fore. So in relation to Chris Ham's question, um, it's intensified the focus yep. on the social determinants of health and the fundamental inequalities in our society that we must address as part of building back fairer. That's great. Well put, Michael. Thank you. Um, we've got four minutes left and I want to give each of you a chance to say a few words. And I'd like to start with you, Angela, if I may. I, I want you to imagine that you've been invited into 10 Downing Street and you have a few minutes with our Prime Minister. What are you going to tell him? Ooh. Um, well, I would uh, ask them to actually stop talking and actually make sure that they follow through with their actions. Or um, So uh, children, uh, I think it's about focusing on now. Um, in May, uh, about a quarter of children didn't have laptops. Um, and then in July, they, a quarter of children still didn't have laptops or decent access to IT. Um, if they are having to work at home, then they need that access, so sort that out. Um, there is a, an, a crisis uh, looming with regard to the, the funding of some schools, um, so you better sort that one out too. Um, please extend catch-up funding um, and make sure that it's sufficient for the, um, well, 98% of children were behind, 48 uh, I think the, our estimate was that 44% needed intensive catch up. A billion pounds doesn't go very far with regards to that. Um, and so um, please okay. prioritise children. There you go. That's great. Thanks very much, Angela. Um, Andy, you're in front of Prime Minister Boris Johnson. What are you going to say to him? Well, I have been there a bit. In, You've in been recent there. <laughs> I, I would repeat something that I often say that things don't become a problem only when they happen in London. Uh, the, the issue of damage to the economy is not uh, just a new issue. Um, we've been under restrictions all year, and I, I think that the damage to people's lives, mental health, jobs, is huge. It's bigger than people realise here in the North, and we've been definitely levelled down this year. So are you serious, Prime Minister, about levelling up? Because it's beginning to feel to people here that you're not. Uh, and we will work with you if you are. And you know, we're ready, absolutely ready to do that. But let's look at what's come out of this pandemic. You know, the low paid work that we've all talked about, the insecure work, the poor quality housing in the North. Leveling up starts with people, Prime Minister, not with yeah. promises of big railway lines in 30 years time. It starts with people, it starts in homes, it starts in communities, it starts with giving them better work, better housing, cheaper public transport. Actually, mm. that basic income idea, it puts, yeah. if you put a foundation among, uh, beneath every citizen in terms of good home, good income, I think you save so much in public spending in terms of wasting it on you know, crisis intervention later, later down the line. And the final thing I would say to him, Richard, is yeah. you're going to need a public inquiry after this uh, pandemic. And I've got just the chair for you. He's called Professor Sir Michael Marmot. <laughs> very good Andy thank you very much Michael you have the last word before we go into the video from the Health Foundation um, the, gee thanks Andy <laughs> um, <laughs> what I would say to the Prime Minister is Prime Minister we would like you to lead and that means establishing a fair distribution of health and well-being as 
the mission for the country. We would like you to chair a cross government committee of all cabinet members that puts a fair distribution of health and well-being right at the heart of government policy. And that fair distribution would be geographic, which is dealing with the questions that Andy talked about. It would be ethnic, dealing with Black, Asian, minority ethnic groups, and it would be socioeconomic, dealing with deprivation. But that should be the mission of government, to create a government with greater uh, and fairer distribution of health and well-being. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Angela. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everybody who's been watching the first half of this launch. And now we hand over to a video from the Health Foundation. Please give a virtual round of applause. Uh, the impact of COVID on health is evident uh, at so many different levels. There is the direct effect of the virus directly on health. Uh, and then there is the way that the various measures that are having to be taken in order to protect people from the virus are, are impacting on factors like employment, like education, which in turn indirectly affect people's health. The pandemic is intensifying and amplifying existing areas of inequalities. COVID-19 is a massive external shock to the social system. External shocks expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. We published a report with the support of the Health Foundation in February 2020, showing that the slowdown in improvement in life expectancy in the UK was more marked than in any other rich country except Iceland and the United States. And then the pandemic happened and the Office for National Statistics looked at excess mortality. And the excess mortality in England was higher than in Scotland and other parts of the UK and higher than in any other European country. And the effect of COVID-19 on society is so massive. Huge economic downturn, exaggeration of inequalities. That this review that the Health Foundation is conducting is of the utmost importance. And that's why I'm happy to support it. One of the striking things uh, that has emerged from the coronavirus pandemic is how it has impacted differentially on different segments of the population, how it has reinforced existing health inequalities and the appearance of those existing health inequalities. People living in poorer areas have a much higher risk than people living in richer areas. This is almost certainly a result of individual differences in socioeconomic uh, uh, fortunes. Uh, and ethnic minority people, of course, this most striking finding that we've seen is that ethnic minority people are at much greater risk of mortality from uh, COVID-19 uh, than uh, the majority population. It's vital to consider the wider determinants of health when we think about the coronavirus pandemic, because this wasn't just a health crisis. It was also an economic crisis and a social crisis. It had effects on every single part of our lives. Surely we can make this an opportunity for change. <laughs> we need to tailor our responses to the coronavirus pandemic in order to ensure that they do not amplify 
and rather reducing qualities. It's crucially important that we have an inquiry that focuses on the question of inequality in relation to COVID-19. An inquiry that looks at health inequalities, both in the immediate context of COVID-19, but also in the longer term. So how the responses to COVID-19 may be amplifying health inequalities. And at the same time, looks at those fundamental drivers that are uh, producing these health inequalities, both in relation to COVID-19 and in relation to the consequences of COVID-19. I think the results of this inquiry will enable us to try and make this a turning point for health inequality. What this inquiry does that I think can add value to all of that uh, other work, we are going to try and understand the different pieces of work that, that are going on, to join them up, to connect them, to be able to see the bigger picture, to extract some really important themes and to provide a solid evidence base that people can draw on in starting to answer these questions, both about what the, uh, the, the, the short and medium term recovery policies should be and also uh, understand over the longer term how we can improve people's uh, health and uh, you know, tackle some of these very, very big issues of inequality. Hello, and thank you, Richard, for that incredibly interesting first half of this webinar. Uh, we're now moving into the second half, and over the next 45 minutes, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, exploring how today's report uh, can help us with the COVID-19 impact inquiry and how we can address some of the challenges that are raised by the pandemic. I'm delighted to be joined uh, by speakers and members of the inquiry's expert advisory panel, uh, James Banks, Fozia Earfun, Polly McKenzie, Liz Sace, uh, and of course we still have uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot with us uh, and we'll be hearing uh, from all of our panel members later on. We'll also have uh, an audience Q&A later on, so do please keep questions coming in and we'll try to come to some of those later. But I'm going to start by asking uh, a couple of questions uh, directly of, of Michael. Uh, Michael, uh, in the report, you've highlighted the links between the economy and health. Um, earlier on, when you were speaking, you talked about inequalities in society leading to inequalities in health then leading to inequalities in COVID. You talked about the link between poor health coming into the pandemic and the experience that the UK has had of the pandemic. There's still a tendency to talk about, to see the two in opposition. Um, and how do you think we can get over the message better that a healthy population and a healthy economy actually go together uh, and they're not in, in contradiction? Look East. Um, if we look at Japan, at Hong Kong, at South Korea, at Taiwan, at China. Uh, look at the countries that managed the pandemic well, that got cracking very early with test, trace and isolate. They've had very small hits to their economy. We have the largest excess mortality in Europe and the worst hit to our economy in Europe. If you manage the pandemic well, then you don't have to have the kind of uh, societal responses that damage the economy to anything like the same extent. So um, I've been debating with economists for decades about whether health leads to a better economy or a better economy leads to better health. In the case of COVID-19, they're clearly intertwined, manage the pandemic, and then you don't have to take those big economic decisions. And then, as you said, Claire, we've got these huge social and economic inequalities that make people more susceptible, both to getting the infection and to having it more seriously when they get it. And one of the most striking things for me about that first conversation that we've been part of was this sense that you know there is nothing new. Um, as you said, uh, uh, Michael, in response to Chris Ham's question, it isn't that that this latest uh, report has, has thrown up a whole lot of new things that people hadn't heard before. It's about an intensification of an understanding that we had. Um, and you know, having worked in, in uh, health uh, for you know, many years ago, we were having the same conversations. Why do you think it is that it's so difficult for people to hear a message that to many people seems very obvious? Well, it's not universally difficult to hear. Um, we've had ready take up of these messages at local and regional government. Uh, we've been working with cities around England and in Europe where there's a ready take up uh, of these messages. There was, um, there is 
a health inequalities alliance that was launched a few weeks ago with 77 health care organizations and royal colleges, royal colleges, physicians, pediatrics, and so on. It's now more than 100. So all sorts of people are listening. Regrettably, national government does not appear to be listening. So it's not that no one's listening. It seems to be that almost everybody except the central government is listening. Well, if enough people say we need change, maybe the government will respond. And I think that's a very, uh, it's a very interesting point, but there's a, there's a, uh, something which I think may, I know Polly McKenzie uh, has talked about, which is there's, there's an interesting question about people's appetite to hear messages. And then w when it comes to some, sometimes some quite difficult personal choices, uh, whether they're ready, uh, we're ready to make them. And it'd be interesting uh, maybe to explore that a bit as, as we go through this discussion. Um, one of the other things that came up was, was the, uh, I mean, you were talking about GDP, um, you know, GDP as, uh, sometimes feeling like you know, the, the, the single thing that people are interested in when they're talking about recovery. Do you think there's too much emphasis on GDP? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's been a worldwide movement to say, let's do it differently. Um, when Sarkozy was president of France, he set up a commission with famous people, Amartya Sen, Joe Stiglitz, um, Fitoussi, uh, at alternatives to GDP, there's been a worldwide movement. It goes back to Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy said, GDP captures everything except what we most value. It doesn't capture the play of our children, the joy of our families, the love of our country. It doesn't capture anything that we really value. So the idea that the sole arbiter of whether government is performing is GDP is just out of date. Um, and that's why we say let's put a fair dis distribution of health and well-being. Uh, I look at our rankings on child well-being. I look at our rankings on improvement in life expectancy and say we're doing really badly. And if you look at the US before President Trump, the US life expectancy had stalled. The US's child poverty level is nearly the highest among any of the OECD rich countries. The country's doing really badly. And yes, the stock market's booming. Um, GDP's been growing, but until the pandemic, um, but they're the wrong markers. We want to know how well the population is doing. And when I call for better governance, that's part of what I mean, putting health and well-being at the heart of government policy, not narrow economic criteria. And is there a particular index uh, that you've come across that you think would be a good way of balancing it? Sorry, I'm just, I've, I'm just suffering a nosebleed. I'm just going yes, to... Uh, full of sympathy. Um, ...and join you. But uh, could, could you give us a moment on that, Michael? Well, the uh, ONS is trialling a health index, which is uh, of great interest. Uh, I'm not usually like looking at one single index. They're different indices for different purposes. Uh, so life expectancy is hardly a perfect index. Um, there are all sorts of shortcomings to it, but it's useful as an indicator of telling us how things are going, but it doesn't tell us about child well-being. Now, I don't particularly want to combine child well-being and life expectancy into one index. I think they tell us something different and we should look at those. I've even had Amartya Sen say to me, he is the intellectual fount of the Human Development Index, which combines life expectancy education and gross national income per person. And Amartya Sen said, don't combine them, Michael, use them separately. Now, the Human Development Report acknowledges Amartya Sen as the inspiration. And he said, use them separately. So I'm not much in favor of one single index. Thank you. And, and I'm just going to stay camera off for the moment, but uh, uh, just moving on uh, to the, the, the way in which your uh, report connects into the inquiry. Um, one of the questions we're really focused on uh, is both understanding what's happened, but also looking forward and being able to um, uh, the, sort of the exam question is, uh, 
for a government that was genuinely interested in improving the nation's health, what are the things that it would be sensible to focus on coming out of the pandemic? I think that connects very nicely with the point you were making about uh, a cross-government committee. Um, and I wonder if you could just, uh, just sort of give us a sense of what do you think, uh, how do you think the inquiry can most benefit from build on uh, the findings that have come out of your review? I think the, the inquiry that you're chairing, Claire, uh, that the Health Foundation is sponsoring, can play an absolutely invaluable role. And I think we need action at two levels, and the inquiry can help with both of these. The first level is the one I've just been saying, to change the way the government thinks about its mission by putting a fair distribution of health and well-being at the heart of government policy, and saying to government what that actually means uh, about the way they go about their business. But the second is we need very concrete, practical actions through the life course. We talked about early childhood, about education, about employment and working conditions, about everyone having at least a living wage, enough money to be able to have a healthy life. Ideally, people in work getting that, but if they can't work, a generous social safety net. And the fifth is healthy and sustainable places to live and work. What does that actually mean in practical terms? And how do you get the balance right, as Andy Burnham was calling for, between action at the center and action in cities and regions? And actually putting detail on that, I think the inquiry can do an absolutely invaluable role. That's great. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, I'm going to move on to our uh, panel members uh, now and just ask them for uh, some reflections, um, particularly kind of linking up uh, the, the, the findings from uh, Michael's review, the inquiry that we're all engaged in, and the, the specific areas uh, where, as panel members, you bring uh, such valuable insights to, to the inquiry. Um, so, um, starting with um, Polly and the social impacts, um, Polly, can you just uh, give us a sense of um, how you think that the, uh, this new report adds to our knowledge uh, of the impact uh, of COVID, the, uh, on the, the social impacts of COVID, and what it might mean for the inquiry? Well, I think it, it's immensely valuable to just think through and document the extraordinary kind of ripple effects that this has had. You know, Michael was talking about, about some of them earlier in terms of uh, people's education, people's experience to trauma, um, and the ways in which the, 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 the diversity of people's experience is nevertheless, as always, so heavily correlated with people's socioeconomic uh, circumstances. Um, I mean, we at Demos have been doing a, work, a piece of work called Renew Normal to try and identify the ways in which public expectations and attitudes have actually changed through the pandemic, because I think it's very easy for those of us who have been reading Michael's work for decades and are kind of steeped in this way of thinking to assume that uh, it was now obvious and I think I think there has been a shift in public opinion and attitudes about um, about what people what people want from their society but it's it's not as dramatic and it needs to be considered it needs to be um, understood uh, at, uh, fully, I think. I think we need still to do more work um, in the inquiry in terms of how you might build a narrative that might persuade people to actually take different actions. So we just put out a piece of work last week that suggests that twice as many people have reinforced their views, both left and right, as have changed their minds as a result of this pandemic. And lots of us will be in that group of people who always cared about socioeconomic justice and now we care about it even more and we think even more obvious but there will be people on the other side who used to think things and have reinforced their views against us and it's that group have changed their minds for whom different narratives and different language uh, may be used um one of the areas where i think uh, uh, there is real momentum for change as a result of this is around what mike was just talking about kind of uh, say for high quality living environments is actually around green space that we've seen, it, it comes top of our research, is the way in which people's desires and expectations and crucially willingness to pay tax to fund more and better maintained green space for, um, for everybody to access. There's always a danger that you 
build green spaces and it's just easier to find the space and you know or make it accessible for people who don't suffer from socioeconomic disadvantage nevertheless i think i think there is now a shift in opinion a shift in momentum that will enable us to tackle some of those environmental uh, experiences that people have because during the lockdown period that that experience of being able to get outside to interact with even just you know very very small pieces of nature has been so valuable to people so i think that's definitely one area that we should be building on that's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, um, Polly. And uh, uh, you know, continuing on this uh, on this theme, um, I, I'm going to come to Fozia um, just to talk a bit about uh, the, the you know what this is telling us about uh, the impacts on young people in the community. Um, I have to say, uh, my son is an early years practitioner, and it's it's very encouraging uh, to hear so much focus. On, on early years, which can often feel like uh, one of the neglected areas, but obviously a, a, a broader set of issues about young people in the community. Fozia. Yes, and I think um, the, the, the statement that uh, uh, exposed and amplified pre-existing inequalities really sums up um, this whole issue, because we knew that there were these pre-existing inequalities, particularly in relation to uh, socioeconomic deprivation, ethnicity, etc. Um, and I think the focus on children and young people, uh, young people really needs to be amplified. Uh, children in need, we've um, been dealing, you know, for the first six months we were dealing with what we could see with the immediate crisis response, and that that was um, in relation to issues such as access to essentials, food, medicine, hygiene products, et cetera, and um, in relation to safeguarding, making sure that the home was a safe place. Um, we thought those issues were going to be sort of six month issues, nine month issues. Now we realize that actually these are, these are issues which are going to be uh, you know, with us for the foreseeable future. Digital exclusion, yes, we were able to provide laptops, et cetera, to address an immediate need for some children, but actually that issue of digital exclusion is going to be so important for the, for the near future. Um, and the three things that we're really focused on and we think um, have to be addressed uh, in relation to the future for your children and young people are in relation to emotional health and well-being. Uh, we've seen a rise in worry, fear and anxiety, which has been highlighted by the report. Missing education is going to have, you know, long term consequences for young people, uh, not just in terms of their future outcomes, but in terms of social, the social mobility gap um, and addressing this, those disparities. And crucially and critically, isolation and the loss of support for children and young people, the loss of those crucial relationships with their peers, within youth groups, within with trusted adults, um, that infrastructure, that network of support has, has just disappeared and combat, compound that with the uncertainty in relation to their education, future employment, et cetera. Um, and I think we are going to be facing the consequences of this of, of, COVID, of the pandemic uh, for a very long time. Um, and if we don't take this work seriously, uh, we will have failed a generation. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Fozia. Um, and, and kind of, again, continuing the same theme, um, uh, one of the groups where we know there's been a huge uh, impact is on um, uh, disabled people, um, both those with physical disabilities, uh, people with hidden disabilities, uh, all sorts of issues about access to services. Um, uh, Liz, uh, I wonder if you could just uh, give us a sense of uh, how, how you, what, what you see coming out of uh, this latest report and how it might impact on our work in the inquiry. Thank you very much, Claire. Yes, and I think what's very powerful about this report is the way it addresses intersecting issues of inequality and power and powerlessness. And I suppose just to remind people that before the pandemic, Joseph Roundtree found that almost half of people living in poverty were either disabled people themselves or lived with somebody who was disabled. So we already had that disability dimension to inequality. And um, the Health Foundation held a round table only last week with disabled people and people with expertise and knowledge in the area. And it was just really powerful hearing directly from people. So, um, and there was an article, I don't know if people saw it in the Telegraph a few days ago by Dame Philippa Russell and her son, Simon, and he, Simon has a learning difficulty. And he talked about how all the things that were his life in effect, and they were small things in a way, art program in the local art gallery, the activities of the church and so on had all gone. 
and in a way his life had gone. Um, so partly it's that sort of a greater impact of something that we all might be experiencing, that we can't go to the art gallery, if, depending on what tier we're in and so on, um, but also much more tangible things. So um, we know from various pieces of research by Joseph Rowntree, Citizen Advice and others that um, redundancy has been more common amongst disabled people than non-disabled people. Uh, destitution has been more common. Um, we know that people with learning disabilities have higher death rates. Uh, we know that there have been these blanket application of do not attempt resuscitation notices, including on people living with cancer, people with um, learning difficulties, etc. Disabled children have been less likely to get remote learning. Um, and for some people, social care has either, and we've heard a lot about care homes, but the care in your own home has been reduced or even stopped. So there's a huge amount going on that leaves life pretty kind of precarious. And I suppose um, that I'm not saying this for a sort of special pleading point of view, but more how important it is to hear all the different voices. And building back fairer is about building back inclusive as well, if you like. Um, and um, there have been some promising uh, avenues of, of activity, I suppose, that have led to certain changes. So, um, for example, on do not attempt resuscitation, it was campaigning partly by disabled people that led to um, statements coming from the British Medical Association, Royal College of GPs and others saying, you know, you, you mustn't use these blanket approaches. It's got to be done in consultation engagement with people. Um, and Greater Manchester Disabled People's in, um, Panel, they came up with recommendations around building back in an inclusive way. Um, which included things like better digital inclusion and better use of equality impact assessments. And I've been wondering, we seem to have two sort of slightly separated out worlds, the world of equality on the one hand and everybody involved in that and the world of reducing health inequalities on the other. And the public sector equality duty when it was first framed did have a socioeconomic duty in it as well as the duties on race and gender and so on. And, and bringing those together as they are doing in Scotland and Wales. I, I just wonder if that would be a powerful way if it was if if that was strengthened to really say every policy must must th involve thinking through, um, you know, socioeconomic inequality and the inequalities on the basis of um, protected characteristics. I think um, we we also found a lot of lo very local examples of good practice, but usually small scale and fragile. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of scope to sort of um, scale those up. So I think the inquiry backed by um, Sir Michael's report really give us a, a, a huge amount of both evidence on the problem, but also ideas for some of the solutions. Lovely, thank you very much indeed, Liz. Um, and, and, and lastly, coming to James, uh, on, uh, just to give us a sense of uh, the, the overall impact on the economy. Um, I mean, it's been very noticeable both in the first half of the webinar uh, and in the discussions we've been having uh, in, this, in this part that you know, the economy is a huge uh, you know, central issue and this, the, the, the relationship between health and the economy. So uh, James, what are your reflections? Um, well, thanks, Claire. Yes, as the economist on this panel, there's an awful lot that I could potentially <laughs> talk about. Um, but I just wanted to try, so I'm gonna try and keep my comments very broad, at least in the first instance. And I wanted to pick up on one thing that Michael said um, in the q and I think, which is this whole idea that post-pandemic recovery policy should not be, finding, not, not, not be about finding the sort of least painful way back to how we were previously. And I think I couldn't agree with that more. Um, and I think the real challenge in thinking about the economic implications and then how those link to health is, is to how to do this in a sort of practical and nuanced way. And so I, I, I think I absolutely agree with what's been said and in the report and in the discussion about you know, this simplistic trade-off between health and the economy or health and GDP is just not the right way to be thinking about things. Uh, it's not even true that there is one, but that doesn't mean to say that there aren't trade-offs, of course, and one has to be sort of nuanced in the way of thinking about what these trade-offs are. And so the way I kind of think about this report, our report going forwards and thinking about a constructive debate on this 
is to really say, I mean, I, I can identify, in some sense, you could think about two ways of thinking about this. One is that, you know, how might the pandemic have had permanent effects on things like the fundamentals that determine e inequality and fairness in our society. So the panic the pandemic itself may have changed the market power of big firms versus small firms. We think that's true. It's changed the sectoral balance in the economy. Certain sectors have been very affected and certain haven't. Um, it's changed socioeconomic inequalities in people's ability to do their job, whether it's working from home or in a, uh, you know, in a sort of, um, essential sector. Um, and most importantly, it's changed probably permanently, at least uh, for some generations, socioeconomic inequalities in education and skills. And so in some sense, those are the things that we know have been permanently affected. So part of a decent recovery policy has to be to say, well, okay, what are we going to do? You know, what are the inequality and fairness consequences of that? And what are we going to do in reaction? And I think thinking through those things in a sort of reasonably coherent way, rather than just saying, oh, all inequality has gone up and we need to do something about it, was one, one, one first um, pillar. The second pillar, I think, in this recovery strategy should be to say, well, actually, the pandemic may also, in addition to have changing the fundamentals, it may also have revealed things about the way we were previously were, uh, or even actually, you know, broken down some structures that were previously inhibiting our ability to change. Um, and those, for example, might be the kind of things that Andy Burnham was talking about, about the, ne the level of governance between the center and the regions, actually, that was kind of a problem already and has been really revealed by the pandemic. Another one I think might be the fact that, you know, the way that we social attitudes are towards social insurance and redistribution, um, you know, we sort of know now that a lot of people are going to be coming into contact with the benefit system who previously wouldn't have been, um, or their families are, and that may even be changing the way that attitudes to societal risks and the way that society ensures these risks um, in the population. So I think those are places where the pandemic might have changed the preconditions for a recovery strategy and it's worth thinking about them as well. So really, I think that's the way as an economist, I would like to think about a constructive way forward. And just to re-emphasize um, uh, that not, not all inequalities are equal, um, if you see what I mean, uh, there are three kind of dimensions. I hope it'll only be very quick, but the, the effect of the pandemic on cross-sectional social you know, inequal income inequalities is one thing. But that's very different from essentially the socioeconomic inequalities in education of skills. That's a very different thing and they need to be dealt with differently. And that again is different to what we might think of as intergenerational inequalities between generations, between those currently old and those that are currently young. So I think we, and uh, you know, there are whole ways in which those three different types of inequalities manifest themselves differently on different genders, on different ethnic minority groups, on different regions. But I think it's always important to sort of break those down so that we can think about the policies that address each in the most appropriate way. Thank you very much indeed. That's a, a very, very uh, interesting reflections. Um, I'm, I'm going to, to move uh, us now to some of the questions that have come in from uh, from participants in the webinar. Um, I'm going to cheat slightly because uh, I'm going to create a kind of composite question, uh, which seems to me to come out of a number of uh, the, uh, questions that are, are, are coming up the uh, are coming up the rankings, and that's how do we take advantage uh, of the current interest, uh, the, you know, the greater exposure, the, the very visible uh, impact of uh, inequalities and the increased interest uh, to try and convert that into uh, things actually happening. Uh, I, I'm gonna go to Polly first, cause it goes a little bit to your point about what people, uh, what people kind of think they want versus what they, uh, what they actually want. But um, if there are other panel members who'd like to come in on this, do, uh, do kind of indicate, because I suspect this is something that uh, more than one people, uh, more than one person will have a uh, view on. So, but uh, Polly, can I go to you first? Yes, I mean, it's, it's a huge puzzle, I guess. Um, my, the first thought I think we need often to remind ourselves of is that there is a proportion of the population 
I don't know exactly how big it is, but for whom fairness is not about equity, fairness is about just desserts and it's about consequences and the consequence choices, including choosing to smoke or eat cake. Um, and we know from a bucket loads of work that we don't need to go into details about that, of course, people are shaped massively in their choices by their environment. Yet, nevertheless, building a narrative that negates the idea, uh, which is essential as a, as, a, as, a, as a sort of motivation of the idea of justice for a huge chunk of the population, that, that fairness has nothing to do with consequences or just desserts, is going to be a problem. Barack Obama was recently quoted saying, much more articulately than I, um, uh, this, uh, this concept about framing is like, what is your goal here? Is your goal to feel with the people who already agree with you or to reach out and persuade a new group of people? And um, I, I recently was speak, I mean, it wasn't that recently because it was in person, so it must have been, you know, nine months ago, but um, I was speaking at an event where we were talking about the environment and the Frameworks Institute had done really great work explain, demonstrating that you could get a whole group, it was particularly in Texas where they'd done the field work, a whole group of people to be really, excited about protecting green spaces and environmentalism if you made it about protecting Texas. I know, you know, we have it here with Keep Britain Tidy, but a sort of a narrative that was, to some people, a little bit too blood and soil, like um, uncomfortable. And the question is, do you, do you allow yourself to use potentially nationalist narratives or potentially xenophobic narratives in order to persuade persuade a group of people to, uh, to, to sign your agenda around, um, around uh, environmentalism or, or protecting, protecting green spaces. And of course, there's always going to be a limit, right? Like, are we going to do that at the uh, at, at expense of other essential values and principles? Of course not. Well, certainly not for me. But I think, I think so often we need to work out ways to reframe and accommodate other value systems systems, other ways of thinking in order to persuade people of the outcomes that we think are important. And it's a different kind of, it's a different kind of discourse. It's not what our currently exhaustingly partisan politics is good at. For me, it's remarkable to think that there is a group of people who find everything Michael Marmot has written utterly persuasive and compelling. And yet the change isn't there. Now you can conclude that that's because, and I've seen some of the questions in the, in the chat, that's because the Tories are evil and they don't care about people. I mean, there may be some of them who are that, but they might just have a different way of thinking about how you might achieve. I believe in markets as a driver of opportunity. And we might need to think about and be open-minded to, so I haven't, I haven't yet got specifics but I do think we have to school ourselves to be open-minded, to occasionally be uncomfortable if we are to bring new audiences on board. It's interesting to me that, you know, uh, in our work, you know, 60, 70% of people are talking about the fact that they would like to see less inequality. They are even willing to say, which is quite new, that they are willing to pay more taxes or higher prices in the shops to see uh, low pay tackled. We have to find arguments that don't just appeal to the left for that, but arguments that appeal to, to the centre right. Uh, there was a moment post 2015, actually, um, when, when there was an argument sort of against corporate subsidies that recast welfare as corporate subsidies, and suddenly the Conservatives were against it. And that's a clever manoeuvre, because suddenly the Conservatives are in favour of higher pay and higher wages, and that's a good thing. Um, regardless of whether it's true, because it's, there's no such thing as true, really, when it comes to whether um, benefits are, are corporate subsidies or personal subsidies or who knows what they are. They're just, you know, James probably has a better answer than me. But I know that there's different ways of describing this, different ways of, of internalising your feelings about what they are. Yep. And if you use different language, you can persuade more people. Yep, brilliant. OK, we've only got a few more minutes left and I'm going to I am going to crack very quickly through a number of questions. If you've got something very quickly you want to add on this one, you may you may attach it to the answer to another question. But we've literally got five minutes and I want to get through a, a number of questions. So um, a question for uh, for Fosia, uh, somebody's asked about how can we give communities a greater say? Can you give us a very quick answer on that? And if you want to say anything more about the first question, you're welcome to add it in. 
well, actually, the two will combine. So I really believe in the place-based approach. I, I come from a community foundation background where we uh, looked at systemic issues, but uh, very focused on geography. And tying into the, the first question, uh, the example of this where I see a narrative which has been really successful, again, a place-based narrative, is in uh, Buffalo, uh, where they built a narrative around prosperity for all, uh, but it was very place-based and it was actually led and was, uh, was, um, had the heavy involvement of the corporate sector and it tackled racial inequality. So racial inequality, which is normally such a difficult subject to get agreement across, uh, was something that was being very, very systematically and systemically tackled um, by this place-based uh, systemic approach. I'd love to go on about it, but I'll bore you, so I'll stop there. Uh, you wouldn't bore us, but we, uh, we are very conscious of the time. Thank you very much, Fozia. Um, Liz, uh, there's a really interesting question uh, from uh, Joe Michelli uh, saying about COVID putting the focus on vulnerable people, uh, reflecting a deficit lens and how we might switch to people being valuable and contributors to society. Could you just give us some reflections on that? Yes, I, I, and quite a number of people have uh, contested this new framing of vulnerable, extremely clinically vulnerable and so on, partly because it drew boundaries around slightly different groups of people from the boundary around disabled people under the Equality Act. So you might find yourself not defined as vulnerable and all of a sudden the supermarkets were not making the adjustments you needed, like giving you, uh, you know, um, online shopping because they were going to the extremely clinic and you couldn't go to the supermarket, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, but equally, um, I think that it feels very disempowering to a lot of people to be told you're vulnerable. There's a lot of disabled people who, who are contributing to others during this pandemic. Um, and it is, however, important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, as some people were arguing last week, which is to say that it is true that disabled people, some disabled people are at higher risk of catching COVID or getting the serious impacts. We don't want to gloss over that. So, you know, if vulnerable to the virus is what's meant, then that's one thing. But being vulnerable and always at the, you know, at the end of somebody else's good works is not a very nice place to be. People want to be full citizens and be, you know, participating fully. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we, we have a couple of questions. I can't find them in the in the list now, but uh, about how we learn uh, from international experience. Um, and um, uh, you know, Michael, you spoke a bit about that. Um, but what would be your top tips in terms of uh, places to look? Uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, looking east. Uh, where else would you advise people to look for good examples, particularly around the broader issues? Well, it's interesting. I speculate there's something called the Social Progress Index, and it looks at society's progress in a number of measures. And I compared Germany, which had handled the pandemic very well, although it's now getting a big increase, as is true all across Europe. Germany, that had handled the pandemic very well. The US, which had been a disaster, and Brazil, which, if anything, had been worse. And on measures of social progress, Germany was high and remained high. The US was getting worse. Dramatic drop in various indices, starting around the 20th of January, 2017, can't imagine what happened on that date, uh, but their indices of social progress got work worse and Brazil was very bad. So in other words, in trying to learn about how to handle the pandemic, let's look at how well societies were functioning. And Germany on these measures was functioning better than we were and they handled the pandemic better. And for what it's worth, and I shouldn't make too much of this, the leader is a trained scientist. Angela Merkel, uh, by all accounts, communicated very clearly with the German public uh, about the balance of risks and what was going on. Um, I don't think she made many jokes. Um, you didn't use many metaphors, just communicated very clearly with the German population. I'm not the greatest fan of Angela Merkel, but by golly, she did a good job. And Germany was doing well. So you might say, well, New Zealand, you know, it's tiny population, it's isolated. It was easy for New Zealand to do it. But the prime minister said, go quickly, go hard. She said, we've got to do this 
and they're COVID free. Um, Australia uh, managed it well. And again, you might say, okay, they're a long way away and they're isolated. But so it's not just you uh, looking to the East, they're right here in Europe or in the Southern hemisphere, we can find countries that have done it well. And if I can, just while, just my last comment this morning, um, I mean, what a great panel you've got assembled. And I don't want to draw attention just to one because they've all been great. But I think what James Banks said is absolutely vital. It really is the opportunity to look at how things have changed and what we have to do differently. And his three dimensions of inequality, I think are absolutely right. It's not just income and wealth, education and skills and other social influences. And particularly coming back to what Andy Burnham said about Build Back Greener, the intergenerational equity demands that we build back greener as well as build back fairer. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, we are really completely out of time. I was going to come to James and ask uh, about uh, better access to health data, um, which I'm sure as an economist, uh, you would be interested uh, you would uh, be interested in data, but uh, we are really out of time. So I will just give you kind of one sentence to say whatever you would like to say, James. Uh, OK, well, I won't start talking about data because that would really take me off over time. But uh, I'd like to go back to this issue of what could we learn from other countries, actually. And I think the first thing, two, two things I would say, one is that this, um, the way in which public services and indeed healthcare have been organized, coming back to what's at the national level and what's at the local level, uh, I think it's got something quite a lot to do with things. So, you know, arguably, I mean, Andrew was very persuasive on saying track and trace should have been local from the start, but arguably PPE should have been national from the start as opposed to local. So I think we've got an awful lot to know about the capacity in our health and social care service and how that capacity has been organized, we can learn a lot there. The other thing I would say, and this goes back to the inequality point and the fairness point, is that essentially what we've been doing in Britain is dismantling social insurance. And um, you know that we've been moving to in to in work benefits and, and that we, with all the sort of for the reasons and the consequences that we know about. But the countries that have had social insurance are a lot of these countries that are kind of well high up on Michael's index, you know, so, and those countries essentially haven't had to do so much. So if you look at, for example, pandemic recovery policies, they're much smaller in Germany and Belgium than they are in Britain, because the existing system is already doing things to, to ensure those kind of shocks. So how we come out of this in terms of thinking about our society's preferences to ensure future shocks is I think the key question. I think we can learn from other countries that what they've done, and we can think about that whole debate, I think in a new light, uh, if we're co conscious of what, how, how the pandemic has played out in different countries. Thank you so, so much. Now we are absolutely out of time. I have failed my chairing duties with ending on the duff of uh, 10.30, but that was such uh, valuable and rich material. I hope you will forgive us for having run over uh, by two minutes. Um, so please can I thank all of our speakers, it's been absolutely uh, brilliant hearing from you today um, and also thanks as well to everyone who's joined us. Um, I hope you found uh, the, the, uh, the webinar in its two parts uh, useful and it's given you some food for thought about how you approach your own work. Uh, the webinar has been recorded, uh, it will be available to watch on demand if you want to go back to anyone, uh, to any of it and we'll let you know when it's ready to, uh, to view. Um, and lastly, if you're interested in hearing more about the COVID-19 impact inquiry, you can sign up to receive updates on our website. Uh, the next update will be sent uh, this Friday. So do please sign up in the next couple of days and then you will get that as well as our future uh, updates. Um, so it remains only for me to say once again, thank you very much uh, to our panelists uh, uh, in both halves of the webinar uh, and to everyone who's attended and have a good day.